So it's great to be back at the Texas II. So thanks for having us. We appreciate that. So the class today is really designed around lasers and lights. And we get a lot of questions about lasers and lights. And, um, different people use different types. And so we're going to kind of maybe go through the several different types of lasers and lights there are. We're going to start and talk a little bit about bulb driven products. We're going to talk about the advancement in LED products. And then we're going to talk about laser diodes, laser, laser uh, diodes. So, uh, and there's quite a difference uh, in, in technology. So we'll, we're going to kind of go through that. So this is, this is going to be an open workshop. So ask a lot of questions. If you've got it, you know, and then we're going to, like I said, the most important thing is you get your hands on the equipment in the back. So I'm going to go through a few power slides, a little bit about the LEDs and about lamps, about wavelengths, and then we're going to uh, get some hands on. Okay? So forensic light sources. A forensic light source is made up of a powerful light containing one or all the ultraviolet, visible, and infrared components in the electromagnetic spectrum. It then filters down or selects the light by individual color bands or wavelengths. Then enhance the visualization of evidence by light interaction techniques. So this is the electromagnetic spectrum. We start with shortwave UV. Does anybody uh, have an FSIS camera? Does anybody do any shortwave photography? Excellent. Shortwave, we're starting to find a lot more evidence in shortwave with the FSIS camera in shortwave. A shortwave is somewhat dangerous. It's uh, just the UV light, so you got to make sure you're wearing uh, uh, cor corrective covering for your face because it, it will give you a sunburn. Um, so, but there's a lot more evidence to be found in shortwave than we've ever been able to find before. So it's kind of it's kind of new technology in shortwave UV. Then it goes from shortwave into longwave, which was 365. Did anybody have a black light as a kid? Flashlight cluster, okay, UV, 365. Then we move into the violet, into the visual visual spectrum, into the violet, the blue. Blue is your 450. Uh, we primarily look for biologicals with 450 light, 450 nanometer. Uh, and then we go into the greens. Greens are used primarily used for fluorescent of chemical dye stains, your DFOs, your rotamines, your R60s. Kind of get a little bit more into that in a little bit. And we go into your yellows, orange, red, and infrared. Forensic light sources, how they're used in forensics, and Brian Darrell, who is one of the experts, uh, he doesn't really like the word alternate light source. He, 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 he doesn't believe in alternate light source. He's, he's a complementary light source. So uh, anything that we do in, in, with light sources really is a complement. It's not really an alternate. Um, but to visualize different things, like I mentioned before, uh, in forensics, in the green 532, and we have a green 532 laser, it's a coherent tracer. Is anybody familiar with the, with the coherent tracer at all? Okay. Uh, the coherent tracer is a 532 green laser, and primarily what you're looking for with a green laser or in the, or in the 532 bandwidth is chemical treatment processes. end dye, DFO, rhodamine. Rhodamine, for example, is used after fuming. After we fume in a cabinet, we then dip with rhodamine, we then hit it with a laser, a green 532, and then the, the fingerprints will fluoresce. Um, in 455, like I mentioned before, that's a 455 blue. We're looking for biologicals, also other chemical dye stains, like Ardrox, Ram, Ray, and also fluorescent powders. And we're going to look at some of these today. And then 365, UV. And these are the primary things that we use in forensics. UV is 365. In 365, we're going to look for bruising, trace evidence, fibers, and some biologicals. So these are the three primary things that are used in infrared. Alternate light sources, or an ALS, enhances the visualization of evidence not readily apparent for the naked eye, facilitating collection, documentation, and processing of evidence. Fluorescence is the emission of light of a longer wavelength by a substance that has absorbed light of a shorter wavelength. We mentioned there's several different types. One of the types is the bulbs or arc lamps. Stuff where it started was with the bulb. Uh, but bulbs have some inherent problems. One of them is, is uncertain perform performance, or uh, a really you don't have a specific wavelength. What you have is a bulb with a filter. So 
you have a you have leakage on the outside with light coming on coming in. So it's not specific. There's no power meter on a lamp. When was the last time you know that your bulb, light bulb was getting ready to burn out? It doesn't really tell you when it's going to burn out. It just burns out, right? So we really don't have a power meter. So the lamps degrade or dim over time. I mentioned that shift with this bandwidth. Since we're just using a light with a filter, we have so much outside light coming in, it's not very specific. So it can leak 50 nanometers to either side. So although I might say I have a 450 light, if it's a bulb, it might leak 50, 50 to the right, 50 to the left. So if it's 450, it's going to be 400 or maybe 500. So it's not very specific. When you're using those filters, they have a tendency to bleach over time. The, the, the heat from the lamp, from the bulb, will, will actually degrade filters. Bulbs get hot. If you're using a, 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 a wood lamp, anybody use a wood lamp? With the old people? Anybody? Everyone? I'm an old guy, so I've used all that stuff. Yeah, so you've used the wood lamp, right? Get hot, didn't it? Yeah. Right. So. It's also, you got to be careful. Yeah, but that, that was an arc lamp. You burn your desk. Yeah, you're right. You set it down wrong. You're, you're, that's exactly right. Hot. Um, these bulbs are expensive to replace. If anybody's had to replace a bulb in a in a system in a in a system like this before, they're very expensive, up around two thousand, twenty five hundred dollars for a bulb. One of the other challenges was that these bulbs don't last very long. A bulb will last between a thousand and two thousand hours. So that's kind of where we started with alternate light sources with bulbs. Has anybody got a bulb driven product now for alternate what, You got one, Doug? Doc? What do you have? A little Omnichrome or something, maybe? Yeah, the old Brofen? Yeah. Yes. Uh-huh. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. so then came along the LED, right? Yeah. So the alternate light source LED is a light-emitting diode. Uh, LEDs had a greater life expectancy, somewhere around 25,000 to 50,000 hours. They're most often used in a single wavelength because we can buy an LED that's pretty specific. However, still leaks to the right, still leaks to the left. Not, 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 not precise. Not, so in other words, if I say I've got a, a 450, it still leaks probably 10 or 15 nanometers to the right and to the left. And there's hot spots in your photography. If you've ever tried to use an LED light in your photography, you need really hard sometimes to get that hot spot out of it. We've got several of these lights in the back that you're going to get your hands on today and actually use them. We've got a 455, which is just a standard crime scene light a lot of folks carry. We've got a tri-light in the back that's got three wavelengths in it. It's got a 385, a 455, and a 530. So a UV, a 455 blue, and a green 530. And then we've got some Rofen Flare Plus 2s in the back. There's a series of Rofens that's really a handheld, very powerful light source. It's got eight LEDs nested in it. Uh, there's a series of those lights, and they come from three, they, and they're delivered from 365 all the way in infrared. We have some of the Rofen products back here in the back too. The evolution of forensic lasers. Did anybody work in a laboratory where you had an old forensic laser before? Wow, which one did you have back there? We had a copper vapor. Wow. Okay, so that you had to heat it up, you had to cool it down. Uh, that was uh, early on, and so. Get ready in about 45 minutes to shut down. Yeah, yeah. So, ion lasers were developed back in the 70s, and uh, it, it was it, it, they were big, big, large lasers, weighed over you know 700,000 pounds, uh, mount them, and you couldn't move them, uh, but they were used to find evidence because people found, well, if we had a big powerful laser, we'd find more evidence. But they were very expensive, you know, 200,000, 250,000, and the maintenance just to keep the things up was just crazy. So as time went by into the 80s, all of a sudden we went into solid state lasers. Well, we, we got them smaller. Uh, they weighed about 175, 200 pounds. Um, they were still very expensive, still over $100,000. And then in the 2000s, the tracer laser came out from Coherent. Coherent is the largest manufacturer of tracers in the world. Still probably 90% of the forensic labs have a, have a tracer laser. Uh, very popular. 40 pounds? Costs around thirty-five, forty thousand um, dollars. Single wavelength, single wavelength green five thirty-two. And then today, 
with the advancement of the new Dual 77, we have a five pound laser, seven watts of blue, seven watts of green out of a five pound box, portable, and it's around $22,000. So we're gonna actually be able to see it today too. The tracer has a laser diode. It's, optically pump, it's an optically pumped semiconductor laser, uh, 20 to 40 times more power than any kind of LED. It's a single wavelength, like I mentioned, it's 532. There's no leaking. So when I talked about these LEDs having this big bell curve with this outside light coming in, a laser diode straight up, straight down. That's where we generate so much power out of it. There is no leaking. So when it's 532, it's straight D 532. As well as the dual 77. It's also a diode laser, straight peak lasers out of, out of the pistols. There's another product in the industry from Brightbeam. Um, they also have a dual la uh, laser uh, that's 455, 520. Uh, heavy, uh, not, not near as portable as the, uh, as the smaller lasers. So here's some comparison results, and you're going to be able to see this with your own eyes here in just a little bit, but I wanted to show a couple slides. So the first one is an ALS with a bulb of a, of a latent print that's been treated. Then the second picture is the ALS with an LED and then with a laser. In certain, in certain cases, it's the difference between finding it and not. The same thing with the next set of photographs. You can barely see the latent print with a bulb and then the detail with the laser. The one on the left was a, a corpse that was found. Um, you, they made out some information on her, on her hand uh, with the LED, but with the laser, they could actually see the phone number and actually made an arrest uh, from a suspect based upon the use of the laser. So it's amazing what can be found with lasers. Lasers are, are, class four, are, are class four device. So that means we have to have proper safety goggles when we use one of them. These are not ALS goggles. There's a difference. There's optical density on it that's different from an ALS goggle to a laser goggle. So we'll be wearing laser goggles today when we use a laser. We've also got some alternate light source goggles where we use an alternate light source if you like to put those on as well. But today we'll primarily just be using argon laser goggles, okay? Um, it's important to also know that if we're, if we're using lasers, we have to capture that image. If we capture that image with our camera, we have to use an argon barrier filter. So we'll use an orange filter. If we're using orange filters on our eyes, we'll use an orange filter for our camera. We also have a new filter uh, called an FF1 filter. Uh, Brian Darrupple has done some studies with the FF1 filter. When, by stacking these two filters together, we've been able to find untreated prints on 15-year-old documents. We're gonna, when we use a laser, it's important to have a laser in use sign. So Pat's gonna be back here at the door. Pat, you're gonna tackle anybody who comes in. Uh, you're in charge of tackling them. Normally we would put a sign that says laser in use in here, but oh, Pat's strong enough to ta tackle anybody up at the front. Um, so as we move forward, what I'd like to do is kind of move everybody back to the back, if that's okay, and let's put some goggles on and uh, let's do our hands-on workshop. Sound good? So when using a laser, a class 4 laser, we want to make sure we use the right barrier protection. So the right barrier protection is actually marked on it where it has 532. This is a 532 laser, so we'll block everything out of 532. This is a blocking filter. So this is a, an optical density for a laser where this is an ALS goggle. It doesn't have any marks or any coating on it at all. This would be used for an alternate light source, a bulb, or a LED-driven product, where this would be used for a diode laser. So let's so go right into the green. This will be just dial this right here to the green. 530. going to do a side-by-side -side with the green laser versus a bulb based product.
this is, uh, what did you say, about three foot away? Yeah, yeah. And then oh, okay. here's the laser. And the light source. Do you guys see this okay? So I think one of the... Back to laser? So this one right here, which is your uh, paper and paper DFO. DFO. Mm -hmm. okay. We can hardly see hardly anything. See. Right. Now switch it. Okay. 